live. Okay. You can start, Simon. Great. Well, thank you, Aaron, and uh, welcome to everybody to day one of our NSF Prepare Lessons and Experiences on Viable Epidemic Response Strategies Workshop. I'm Simon Levin from Princeton University, and I'm one of the co-PIs on this PREPARE project that is supporting this meeting. Before we get started with the presentations, um, I want to take just a few minutes to tell you about PREPARE. Um, so PREPARE is, is an NSF-sponsored virtual organization of multidisciplinary researchers eyes on this PREPARE who are um, interested in developing the scientific foundations and the engineering principles for planning and responding to pandemics. We move to the next slide. Um, so this is the team, and I want to thank, first of all, our fantastic program uh, committee, excluding me, uh, for bringing together this really superb group of experts. And I want to thank the entire PREPARE team for their dedication to supporting this workshop. Of course, to Marv Marde, who um, skills include knowing how to put together a fantastic team. So especially to him and to Aaron Raymond and to Golda Barrow and to um, Lucy, Lily Lee. Um, we've made a lot of progress in the last uh, two and a half years, um, including um, a YouTube channel that has 87 subscribers and over 2,500 views. And um, of course, this the, the this meeting will be available also on YouTube afterwards. Um, Science Before the Storm, these were podcasts. Uh, last year, they had 530 downloads. We've hosted seven workshops uh, and participated in the National Science Foundation's PIPP workshops. We've given multiple presentations, including NSF-sponsored White House meeting and written perspective articles and lots of other products. And we've established scientists, uh, established collaboration with scientists in India through a new rapid project also NSF supported. The overall goal of this workshop is to discuss experiences, lessons learned, and the effective use of epidemic models in developing uh, public health epidemic control policies with applications beyond the pandemic the preparedness that got us really going here. So we're excited to have you with us. And I'm really looking forward to these speakers and the discussion. And I'm going to hand things over to our session chairs, Don Burke and Josh Epstein, uh, for our first panel. So Don and Josh, over to you. OK. I hope my uh, slides have come up. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, thanks, Sai, for the introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, our first session is going to be on uh, modeling the behavioral components of epidemic dynamics for public health. The uh, participants in this panel will be myself. I'm Don Burke. I'm a distinguished professor at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, worked uh, as the director of the MIDAS Center of Excellence for Modeling of Infectious Disease and I'm the founding president of Epistemics. Our first speaker will be Seb Sebastian Funk, who is a professor um, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The next speaker will be Paul Slovic, a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. Uh, the next speakers jointly will be Jiwon Shin, uh, the uh, senior computational epidemiologist, and Josh Epstein, the professor of epidemiology, both at the NYU School of Global Public Health. And then um, joining me in moderating the discussion at the end will be uh, Julia Pulliam, who is the director of the South African Center for Modeling and Analysis. The presentations uh, in order will be, uh, I'll give a short introduction. Uh, then Seb will talk about 
challenges in modeling behavior that will be focused on experiences in the difficulties that have um, been that people have had in trying to model behavior. Uh, Paul will then go on to discuss the psychology of risk and decision making, implications for modeling. Josh and Jiwan will um, uh, talk about toward cognitive epidemiology and agent zero approach. Uh, and then Julian and I will moderate the panel discussion. Our expectation is that this session will last until uh, about uh, quarter to 12. It may be a little longer or a little shorter, depending on how things go. Don, may I inject a question? Uh, Paul, and, Paul and I talked and we, we came to the conclusion that it would best be best if I went first and then Paul went. Would that be all right? Uh, okay, uh, that, um, see, that should be okay. Okay, great. So the uh, statement of the problem is that uh, the here and it's in here's in cartoon form. You have a modeler. You're trying to focus on a particular problem, and there are all sorts of other externalities that bear on the issue. And when it comes to epidemic modeling, like uh, COVID, uh, the the question is how much to put into the model and how much not to put in. If anything we've learned during the COVID epidemic is the huge impacts that human behaviors do have on epidemic dynamics and the necessity of not just, it's not optional, there's a necessity of building behavior into these computational models. Some of the domains that the human behavior affects are the other diseases, the economics uh, in the society, the educational uh, system, um, and uh, if, again, if nothing else, we've learned the politics uh, have had a huge impact on the course uh, of the epidemic. So in a slightly different cartoon version of this, uh, we have the COVID epidemic um, influencing uh, changes in human behaviors, uh, and those um, human behaviors that are epidemic associated are well known of testing and isolation and quarantine and distancing and masks and vaccines. And those in turn are a couple dynamics where the human behavior is changed because of those, uh, the, uh, the, the, the human behavior changes COVID as a consequence of uh, those, those implementation of those behaviors. But it's more complicated than that, of course, is that we have other diseases, economics, education, some of the ones we already know of other diseases that are influenced are influenza and RSV and dengue and drug overdoses. Uh, in the economic sphere, um, employment uh, has changed, the GDP changed, the stimulus payments uh, changed behaviors. In education, school closures uh, have changed the dynamics and childhood development uh, is has been changed and that uh, the politics of anti-COVID vax have morphed into anti-all vaccines, as well as trust in public health. And so the problem is that of course, all of these have feedback systems uh, and couple dynamics. And the questions are how to represent these, uh, how to represent the individual decision-making process, uh, and how to put that all into uh, uh, couple dynamic models. And as I just want to footnote here that these are just the behaviors. I've left out a lot of things, obviously, that are into the dynamics. Uh, the uh, not the least of which are the role of politics uh, influencing these other spheres of human behavior. So uh, for many years now, it's been recognized that uh, that you know, trying to model behavior in epidemics has been difficult. Uh, there was a, re a review by uh, Neil Ferguson uh, many years ago on that the, how models largely ignore um, the individual behaviors. Uh, that uh, Sebastian has been writing in this area for some time uh, in a review over a decade ago. There have been relatively little systematic investigation about how behavior changes affect disease dynamics. Um, and then a review uh, again from the UK uh, only five papers made explicit reference to psychological uh, health behavior change theories. Um, the um, COVID epidemic has um, 
shown a bright light on this problem. And uh, there have been several reviews that have uh, dealt with this. Uh, uh, one uh, um, said that despite the clear need and potential for an opportunity, uh, progress has uh, been slow. Uh, another has said that uh, um, epidemics, uh, and the human behavior and its impact on progression of epidemics is hard to measure and hard to model. Uh, and uh, human social sociality remains an underappreciated component. So I think we all appreciate that this is important, but is not being done and not being done well. Uh, um, in, uh, this has been recognized. The NSF has implemented a whole series of new grants for research in epidemiology and behavior. So there's hope that uh, we'll start to get a better handle on these issues. But for the, for the time being, um, this is not well done in most models. Um, the, uh, some of the areas that, uh, that we can focus on to improve the modeling of behavior would be the, the theory behind uh, the behavior change uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and then implementing that as the science of behavior change. And, but we also need the, the data to um, inform the models. We need the computational tools uh, to allow us to um, perform the simulations and models. Having institutional homes and, um, and support for this particular area would be important. And then a, an emphasis on uh, training uh, at this interface. All of these things can and should be done. Um, I have, for one, have been working in this area on tools uh, of, for modeling. Uh, I, I do want to say that uh, uh, that I have a I'm a co-founder and president of a company that uh, creates and distributes agent-based modeling software for simulating complex social dynamics and have a financial interest in that company. But the reason we put the company together was to create the tools and make them available. Uh, and this is, the, it's an agent-based modeling platform. If you're interested, the company's name is Epistemics and you can um, look it up yourself. I'm not gonna be talking about that. We may get into that in the discussion. But for this uh, panel, uh, we'll focus more on the upfront, uh, the, the theory and the science uh, that uh, uh, the combination of uh, uh, Paul and uh, Josh and Jiwon, uh, we'll spend a lot of time on that, uh, and uh, but then when we get uh, to the uh, the discussion, uh, we'll talk about all of these things. Uh, hopefully, that will bring it all back to the reality of how can we implement these uh, the the uh, these the theoretical and the scientific and all of these components into real world behavioral components. So that's uh, my introduction. Uh, the uh, our first uh, speaker. Uh, will be Sebastian Funk. Uh, Seb uh, is uh, the uh, a professor uh, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine with an interest in using computational models uh, for infectious disease data to better understand and predict uh, infectious disease dynamics. So uh, with that, uh, Seb, do you want to take control, please? Thank you very much, uh, Don, and thanks for the uh, invitation to speak and for the introduction. And I will try to share my screen. Okay, um, right. Um, okay, so here's a few reflections on something that actually has already been touched upon in the introduction on um, what I see are the challenges and with a particular focus on uh, where I think they have come to the fore in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this essay has been already mentioned and there's plenty more. I think we have known for a long time that um, behavior, uh, affects or individual behavior affects the um, spread of infectious diseases. Um, that inf probably the spread of infection also affects behavior, and that there's some kind of feedback that we need to better understand, and that ideally we should include in models. But 
we often don't and we often don't quite know how so there's kind of mention here of um individual responses have been largely ignored despite growing evidence of their importance and some suggestions for how this could be addressed but um it has remained a challenge and uh, with some uh, co-authors a few years ago in 2015 we put together some more specific or a more specific list of what we felt were the main challenges that could be addressed uh, amongst which things like setting a baseline of behavior so how how people behave in the absence of an event like a pandemic and then determine the effect of departing from it um assessing how and to what extent behavior should be modeled explicitly determining in, determining the middle, minimum level of detail required quantifying changes in reporting behavior and then also predicting the response to interventions and health campaigns identifying the role of movement and travel um verifying models against digital data sources and lastly uh, informing real-time data collection and engaging in a dialogue across disciplines now on the topic of data and this brings me to uh, reflecting on the COVID-19 pandemic I think it's fair to say that we have had unprecedented amounts and quality of behave of data on behavior in the pandemic and uh, one particular example that I think is interesting because the data collection has been informed by um, properties of mathematical models and the design of mathematical models is the the comics study which has led to a number of publications uh, I'm highlighting this one from Amy Gemma in uh, plus medicine very nice summary of the data collection in England this was a European project so uh, run in 20 different countries I think and so you can see here at the top this is hospitalizations in England over the first year of the pandemic with the first wave and uh, corresponding lockdown ending and then uh, increase here there was a second lockdown and the emergence of the alpha variant uh, leading to a third lockdown up to April and corresponding here so um I said the design was inspired by mathematical models and in fact it was um it, it was a study design it was based on weekly surveys um similar to the uh, much perhaps better known polymod study from 2007 so uh, a retrospective diary study who have you come in contact with in the last 24 years uh, 24 hours rather um but looking at a uh, split up in age by years and allowing to quantify the amount of contact between these different age groups and so just in this plot for example you can see um how behavior after the end of first lockdown how the number of contacts still stayed comparatively low um and then with a particular effect at the end of school holiday in uh, school age children um but also in other age groups increase in contacts um much less reduction in behavior in uh, contacts in the second lockdown during which schools were open uh, and then a sort of in between level perhaps later on when school again uh, schools again were closed now all of this is fantastic um data but I think it's fair to say that in spite of unprecedented data availability quantifying the relative the relevant the relevant behaviors in models has still been challenging and I'll give you one example so this is um from uh, a paper by Rosie Barnard and others using one of the models that's been uh, very influential in the UK in quantifying the pandemic and uh, informing policy relevant scenarios so it's a very detailed mechanistic models model trying to capture all the relevant um, interactions and factors relevant in the pandemic and uh, I think like many others so I talked about the availability of data and what that has allowed is to use data where perhaps theory theory was absent in terms of behavior so it, it allowed to put a behavioral component into models because there was a sort of regular weekly data collection and um, a few things to highlight here so I mean so here at the top so this is actually Google mobility I'll come back to this in a moment and then there was um quantification of behavior based on that and the comic study that I just mentioned uh, but it turned out that wasn't actually sufficient combined with information on immunity and biology in explaining dynamics so there was an additional transmission adjustment um that was that changed week by week and actually shows a fair amount of fluctuation so these behavioral measurements weren't sufficient to explain what happened in the pandemic and uh I think as far as I'm aware 
all the models that have been used, all the mechanistic models that have been used to inform policy in the pandemic had some sort of adjustment of that sort. And I don't think there's really been a true, in that sense, mechanistic model um, uh, of COVID-19 in the pandemic. Uh, now, I've mentioned Google Mobility, and the reason there's Google Mobility data in there is because COMIX um, was uh, gathered weekly and was also at a f relatively coarse um, national or sort of in terms of a geographical representation, um, didn't have enough statistical power at the regional level to inform a model at the regional level. So there's some kind of um, practical issues in, in sample size and running a study of that size. So um, Additionally, Google Mobility was used to inform that model, but um, there's, of course, additional issues with using, for example, mobility data, given that um, it was almost explicit government policy to allow mobility to relax and to come back while still maintaining uh, safe transmission behavior. There are all sorts of complication, and um, Perhaps one alternative, and uh, brings me to another study by um, Petra Klepak and others, is to use um, mobile phone data on contacts directly, or rather use data measured on contacts directly. So this is from a large study uh, conducted in 2019 for a television documentary called BBC Contagion, um, a huge study enrolling uh, nationwide participants um, with a particular focus on one town where people were tracked for three days. Uh, and everyone's movements or everybody who enrolled, their movements were tracked for um, three days. And then a nationwide study where um, people were tracked on a kilometer grid for 24 hours, everybody who enrolled, as well as lots of additional data collected on um, people's contacts and behaviors. So again, this is pre-pandemic, but huge amount of data, huge um, wealth of information, fantastic study, uh, allowing to simulate uh, an outbreak but not particularly useful actually in the pandemic because it was pre-pandemic behavior. And also because the, the, the level of detail in this data came with additional challenges. So just having more data avail available doesn't necessarily mean uh, you can quantify behavior better. Now, one reason why quantifying behavior would have been so important in the pandemic and is so important in a pandemic is because we still do not have a good handle on the relationship between government action and behavior. And so it's really difficult to learn what the impact of certain non-pharmaceutical interventions has been because we don't know what the baseline behavior is in what people would have done without that intervention. And that makes it also different to draw conclusions about or make recommendations for future pandemics on um, the potential effectiveness of NPIs. Now, one example of um, a study that tried to estimate the effect of NPIs out of many is this one by Sharma and others. So trying to estimate the re reduction in reproduction number um, from different interventions. And one of the key conclusions here was that there was no um, ability to generalize in time. So it wasn't the same or effect in the first wave didn't predict well um, uh, the effect of NPIs in the second wave. And then also there was some extra validation on a, on a third wave. And this is across European countries. Um, so in the absence of any theory or any kind of insights beyond measuring the impact of NPIs, it's very difficult to um, quantify their true effect co compared to a baseline or even predict their effect compared to a baseline of no intervention. And uh, we can we could also see this in some instances where this was again measured directly in surveys. So this is one survey um, by Alan Brooks Pollock again, uh, and others conducted in in England. On this was at the time of the emergence of Omicron, trying to understand whether people would change their behavior uh, in response to the government's announced so-called Plan B. So this was a survey on behavioral intentions, which comes with its own problems. Um, but one interesting bit in there was that most people said that they would change their behavior and were planning to limit contacts, but only half of them said that that had been affected by the government announcement, suggesting that the other half um, were reducing their contacts for some other reason, perhaps you know out of um, as as a direct response to um, the the uh, increase in cases or media reporting or whatever else it may have been. So on the topic of baseline behaviors then, so there's this one, um, uh, there's this issue of um, 
what do people do in the absence of an intervention? And there's related to that also, what do people do when they're ill, right? So there's some kind of behavioral response to um, having an illness. And this is from the 2009 pandemic flu uh, um, epidemic study by Kim van Kerkhove and others, again, measuring contacts um, during the pandemic and trying to quantify uh, the differences in behavior between people who were uh, healthy and people who had influenza-like symptoms and showing, as you would expect, a drastic reduction in contacts of people with influenza-like symptoms, which makes it difficult to then assess, for example, the effectiveness of an intervention such as contact tracing. Now, all of that to think then maybe, well, if it's really hard um, to, to quantify all of this behavior, or if we kind of, you know, there's there's all these issues, but um, if, we, if we, we, we struggle to put it into models, um, I think it's important to bear in mind that because of all of these things, assuming that behavior does not change is a strong assumption and uh, is often more difficult to motivate than any other assumption about behavior and behavioral change. And in this context, I think it's interesting, uh, there was an interesting case of the um, uh, Danish Staten Serum Institute um, expert group for modeling. So that was the uh, group advising policy uh, using modeling in Denmark uh, at the time when the Omicron variant was emerging in December 2021, when, um, uh, and this was sort of quite good data, was available in Denmark, lots of sequencing done. And the, the, the main model used for scenarios by that group did have a, an element of behavioral adaptation. So here, when incidence exceeds so and so many cases in a region, activity levels reduce gradually until an incidence of something else is reached. Um, now, with respect to what I just said, that may seem somewhat arbitrary, and I'm, it wasn't detailed in that report. There was only a reference to a Danish report, which I couldn't um, uh, understand. But there's no justification given for that number, but it's not really, not having any of that in there is perhaps just as poorly justified. And uh, another, I can think of one, uh, I, so I don't think we often try to quantify this. I can think, of, I, 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 I am aware, there may be others, but I'm aware of one really interesting study that did try to quantify exactly that relationship and these um, feedback loops. So this was looking at, um, ICU uh, infectious um, intensive care unit occupancy versus um, in surveys where the people said they would um, avoid private parties and then some perhaps looking at the data, somewhat questionable curve fit, but all of this is somewhat hard to do in a complicated mathematical model and then uh, similar issues around vaccination and some interesting um, level of contagious contacts with two levels, one that was allowed by current uh, MPIs and then one um, which was due to current MPIs with the difference uh, explained by voluntary, um, uh, well, uh, outlining the range of voluntary action. All of this to say, this is at least some attempt to quantify this sort of feedback loop. But I think in, in summary, it's safe to say, um, as Para said in this really nice review on uh, the use or the link of um, behavior, and infections in uh, infectious disease model is that we still lack a validated theory to describe that feedback loop. So we don't, we have lots of theory and we also now have lots of data, but we don't have the connection between the two. We don't have good theory that is validated in the data. And because of that, that is one of the reasons it's been really hard to forecast um, COVID-19 with behavioral data. And this is one study where that was looked at a little bit. So again, using the comics data and looking at whether that actually improved forecasts of um, future infections. And this is, um, without wanting to go into too much detail here, that the, the lower on this plot, the better. And if, um, if, if having just that data available, improved forecast, you would expect the orange here to be at the bottom. And in fact, it's pretty much middle of the pack. So no evidence that all this data is actually helping us um, make better predictions. And that leaves me just with kind of coming back to these challenges. And I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic, if nothing else, has highlighted these challenges and the fact that they uh, still exist. I think we have lots of good theory and we have, especially we also have good theory on uh, behavior, but we have much less evidence. And I think the main questions are, can we come up with a good system for measuring transmission relevant behaviors in real time and at sufficient scale? 
um, but also can we come up with a good quantification of um, transmission inverting behaviors? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Seb, for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we will hold off the questions until the uh, the discussion period. So uh, let's see, Josh, uh, can you uh, take uh, the, Josh and uh, Jiwan, can you take control of the screen now? I'm hoping so, yeah. Okay, I think that's, that's us. All right, so thanks very much. Uh, I want to show work that uh, that I've been doing with uh, Dr. Jiwan Shin, who will co-present this morning, and uh, Professor Erez Hatna, both of the uh, agent-based modeling lab here at NYU. Uh, the title, let's see, let's see, how do I get this to go into slideshow mode? Mm -hmm. that, that, that worked, but okay, good, okay. So the title of the talk is Toward Cognitive Epidemiology and Agent Zero Approach. And the title is a double entendre, suggesting that epidemiology, we're gonna look at epidemiology with cognitive states driving behavior and epidemiology of cognitive states themselves. We think the cognitive dynamics are, uh, are of interest and the two of these dynamics are, are coupled. And I wanna quickly present three lines of work uh, on cognitive drivers of endogenous epidemic waves. Uh, the first paper I'll discuss in a minute uh, was published by uh, Derek Cummings and me and uh, John Parker and others. Uh, it was called Coupled Contagion Dynamics of Fear and Disease. And in that case, we posited a transmissible disease and a transmissible fear of the disease. More recently, we published a, a model in the journal uh, the Royal Society okay. Interface which adds fear of the control. So there's three contagions, a contagious disease, contagious fear of the disease, and contagious fear of the control. And then having reviewed those quickly, I wanna talk about work that is underway using agent zero to model uh, an epidemic with fear and psychic numbing. Fear, distrust, psychic numbing, uh, which is all closely related to Paul's uh, work. All right. so. I agree with uh, Sebastian that, you know, when you use a perfectly mixed model, you are making a very strong behavioral assumption that people keep mixing, even though there's a deadly plague roaring through their community. And they don't do that because they're afraid. And the fear itself can spread, changing the behavior, producing a coupled contagion of fear and disease. And the fear dynamics, both acquisition of fear and extinction of fear, can produce multiple waves. We know a little bit about fear learning and fear extinction. And in agent zero, I use a very seminal model, the Rascola Wagner model, uh, basically says the fear increase is proportional to the gap between maximum fear and current fear. And it has two modes, a learning mode where the maximum is one, where things are increasing. And it has an extinction mode where the stimulus has stopped and fear decreases. This is the picture of fear learning and fear extinction we get from this traditional picture. Uh, there's this acquisition phase where people gain fear. And then if the stimulus stops, it decays at some rate. And this is exactly the behavior we see in innumerable experiments with vertebrates. I mean, the amygdaloid complex uh, that's responsible for this has been conserved across vertebrate, revolu uh, vertebrate evolution. And we see just this kind of performance, for example, in rats, where there's a conditioning phase and an extinction phase. And if you're interested in the full mathematics, uh, you know, here, here it is. And what I would say is that we don't fear what the rat fears, but we fear how the rat fears. And uh, we're putting this kind of idea into these models. And to go back to the earlier model, there's a single of fear, the coupled contagion narrative there is new cases go up, so fear of the disease goes up. People are afraid, so their contacts go down. And the contacts could be mask wearing, self sequestration, other reversible protective measures. But the idea is cases are up, fear is up, contacts are down, but then the new cases go down and with it, the fear goes down. And now the contacts go back up and 
new cases go up because people pour susceptibles onto these still circulating infective uh, people. And this produces multiple waves, as in 1918 and, of course, in COVID-19. Uh, but it's the premature extinction of fear that drives the resurgence of the disease. People get complacent too early, and they pour susceptibles back onto the embers of infection. All right, and for those who are interested, the way we've mathematized this is basically to have two SIR models. One is for fear, and one is for pathogen. And if you set alpha, the pathogen, the fear transmission rate to zero, you recover the standard SIR infection model. And if you set the pathogen to zero, then you have uh, an SIR model for fear alone, SIR. The difference being that when the fear extinguishes, it drives people back into circulation, back into the susceptible pool, and these produce multiple waves. We publish this in, in PLOS One. And the, again, the narrative is simply that the red curve is the disease. It makes people very afraid. So they go into hiding. That suppresses the disease, but now they get rid of their fear and they pour out of their basements or wherever they're uh, isolating, pouring susceptible fuel onto the infectives and you get a second wave. And this is really what we see, roughly speaking, in 1918 in the UK, Wales, US cities. Characteristic of this scenario was uh, Chicago, where the thing blew up and the uh, commissioner of health said, go home and go to bed until you're well, right? So there's a big spike, everybody goes home, it suppresses the thing. And then he says, we're practically out of the woods, all bans are off, right? They were practically out of the woods, but it doesn't take a lot of infectants to make the thing blow up again. And that's what happened, all right? That was a two contagion picture, a particulate transmission, a viral particulate transmission and a cognitive behavioral one, fear. And we extended this to a triple contagion model with two contagions, one of the disease and one of the control, two contagious spheres, and published that recently in the Royal Society interface. And again, not to get you know, too involved, but the idea there, it's a different narrative. It's not, it's, it has to do with the relationship between the two fears that's driving these multiple waves. Again, if new cases go up, the fear of the disease exceeds the fear of the vaccine and people take the vaccine, but that suppresses the development of new cases, which makes fear fall. And if it falls to a level below the fear of vaccine, people stop taking the vaccine and new cases come up and you get multiple waves again, as in smallpox historically, COVID-19. Again, I think this also sort of rhymes with history. We discussed this at great length in that paper. Uh, but again, it's contagious, it, it's the, decay of fear that controls the second waves, which can be much bigger than the first. In the high decay case, people prematurely abandon distancing, igniting the second wave. And also adverse vaccine events can produce vaccine refusal, which can also generate subsequent waves. All right, all of this uh, is part of a larger agenda, which I call generative social science. The idea being that to explain a social regularity is to demonstrate how it could emerge on timescales of interest to humans in a population of cognitively plausible agents. And I'm interested in explaining, and I distinguish that from predicting a, a distinction we could come back to. But this is the idea, grow it in a population of cognitively plausible agents. What are those? Well, I think the minimum desiderata for cognitive plausibility is that the agents have emotions and in our case, we're particularly interested in fear, they also have bounded deliberative capacities. They're not, they're enumerate largely, they're not good at statistics, they have bounded rationality, as Herb Simon said, and they're connected to other agents who are driven by fear and are statistically hobbled. And all of those factors might matter, and one candidate, a candidate is Agent Zero, which I published and I acknowledge uh, funding from the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, published in the Princeton Complexity Series. And I present this as an alternative, a formal alternative to the rational actor. Uh, and I do try to give Agent Zero distinct affective, deliberative, and social modules, each of which is grounded in neuroscience. Those internal modules interact 
to produce individual behavior, which might be dysfunctional, certainly not canonically rational. And when you put multiple agents of this sort together, they can generate a wide variety of collective dynamics in fields of health, conflict, networks, economics, etc. It's all very crude. We can argue about the modules. And the idea was the goal wasn't to get the modules finished, but to get the synthesis started. And we can talk about all sorts of alternatives to these and all sorts of alternatives to the algebraic relationships posited between them. But the idea was let's get going with a synthesis. And I think we did that. Under the hood, agent zero acts, in this case, it would be self-isolate, if his total disposition, I'd call it, exceeds a threshold. So his total disposition, the ICE agent's total disposition, exceeds his threshold. What's total disposition? It's what he'd do alone, plus what he does uh, through the influence of others. So he's got a solo disposition, and then a sum of weighted dispositions of everybody else in his network. What's the solo disposition? That's his fear plus his deliberative module. So the affective fear is, uh, is produced by the Rescorla wagner model that I showed you. And the probability estimate is in a deliberative module where he computes a moving average of local relative frequencies over his memory window. And it's the relative frequency of sick people, <laughs> okay? So there's a fear module, there's a deliberative module, they're connected in this way, and the weights, are endogenous in their own right. They're strength scaled effective homophily between these agents. But again, this is all up for discussion. It's a framework that, that runs and maybe gets our teeth in how all of this plays out. Now, this is what it looks like, again, at, at a very high level. You act if your fear plus your probability, that's your solo disposition, plus the network's disposition is greater than the threshold. All right, action is binary and so forth. Uh, now, we've tried to apply this to epidemiology. We are applying it to epidemiology. And the epidemic variant adds a couple things. Uh, most notably, it adds psychic numbing to this deliberative uh, module. So we have fear, as we did before, and we have social combinations, social dynamics, social network influence, as we had before. But what's, I think, most interesting about this extension is the inclusion of psychic numbing, which Paul Slovic has, has been a huge pioneer in this, in this field. Uh, as he wrote, the more who die, the less we care. And also darkly, Arthur Kessler wrote, statistics don't bleed. And one of the things that amazes me about the COVID epidemic is, you know, if I walked up to somebody and asked them, excuse me, what if I told you a million Americans would die in two years? Would you consider that to be a catastrophe? And I think everyone would say, oh, absolutely. But that's what happened. And it's not how people absorbed the million US COVID deaths. I mean, the suppression of COVID should be like VE day. And it's not. And that's, I think, in part due to psychic numbing. People, because they numb it, they underrate the threat. They're less cautious, which promoted spread. But how do we model this idea of psychic numbing? And where does it come from? It began with work by Weber and Fechner in the 19th century about how we perceive changes. And if you take an example of weight, if you're carrying no weights and I give you 10 pounds, you perceive that as a substantial increase. But if you're already carrying 90 pounds, if I add 10, you hardly notice the difference. So there are specific, it turns out, scaling constants for every, for many stimuli, decibels, temperatures, light intensity, numerosity, but the change in the perceived stimulus, the change in the perceived stimulus is not the change in the stimulus. It's fractional. The change in the perception of the signal is the change in the signal over the level of the signal. And after a little bit of algebra and a tiny bit of calculus, you can show that therefore the, prob the, the perceived stimulus is a constant times the log of the true stimulus. So it compresses the true stimulus very substantially. It's below linear. All right, now what signal are you numbing? Here's where the government comes in. If the government's issuing its statement of infections, I at any time T, and if you don't trust the government, then you have an optimistic bias. If you overtrust the government, you have a pessimistic bias. Fear is Rescola Wagner as before, but the deliberative module with numbing P of I is looks like this. Your perceived 
cases are constant times the trust in government times the government assertion over the level of over the least noticeable difference. And when we put that into these models, we also get very interesting dynamics. And Jiwan Shin will take over here and talk about some of our basic runs of the model, and then I'll pick up toward the end. So Jiwan, the floor is yours. Yes, so from here, I will show you some, some of simulation results. So this is, this is what the NetLogo interface looks like. We have a set of parameters related to disease transmission, fear, deliberation, network effect, and we can change these parameter values and see how the epidemic changes. Um, so just briefly, just to briefly show you what we can get from simulations, figure C in the center is the 10 day moving average of new cases. And as you can see, we can get multiple ways with the agent zero framework. Figure D shows the average fear, the orange curve, deliberation, the green curve, and the total disposition, the gray curve over time. And figure E is the net local world where you can see agents changing their status over time. And the next slide, please. Oh, I'm so sorry, sure. So here's an example of spatial evolution capturing two waves from a single simulation of a particular parameter set. The blue is susceptible, red is infected, green is recovered, orange is disposed to self-isolate, and circle is the self-isolated agent. Uh, in figure B, as disease and fear spread, agents start to self-isolate. Next, as they climb up the first wave, more people self-isolate because they're scared, and figure C is at the peak of self-isolation. Self then in figure D, the number of infected cases go down and self-isolate people come out and recirculate. Then in figure E, because the susceptible pool increases, we get the second wave. And at the end of the outbreak, many are eventually recovered from the disease. Um, let's look at another example of a single run simulation. Here, figure B is the moving average of new cases. The agent zero epi model creates multiple waves, but sometimes the second wave can exceed the first wave like this. Next slide. Um, so the question is, when do we get a bigger second wave? The height of the second wave increases and even exceeds the first wave when fear extinction rate is low, causing premature fear decay, or when weather fattener numbing factor is low, meaning agents are more numb to changes. When you look at figure A, A is the, the comparison of two single runs of different parameter combinations. Uh, we got a bigger second wave, the, the orange curve with high fear extinction rate and low numbing factor. And figure, in figure B, we varied K numbing factor, uh, numbing factor while fixing other parameter values and plotted the average epic curve. Uh, with the low oh, K value. So sorry. Yes. So with low K value, uh, people are, meaning people are more numb to changes. Uh, so the self isolated agents recirculate prematurely, creating the bigger second wave. Uh, besides, this model can create more than two waves depending on parameter combinations like this. In figure B, we see uh, more than two waves. So uh, today we showed several examples of single run simulation of a particular parameter combination, but for full analysis, we have 540 parameter combinations, each for two different R nodes and we ran 500 repetitions for each parameter combination. And so the figure, this figure is the distribution of the number of waves. As you can see, we, our model created different numbers of waves. And the next slide. Now uh, here, green curve is the epic curve of SIR model and orange and blue are agent zero epic model. When we compare our model to SIR, the cognitive driver of um, risk perception and protective behaviors like self-isolation can create multiple ways, but much smaller total number of cases. 
Thank you, Juwan. And again, we did a full statistical analysis of that. And what's quite interesting is that, you know, we don't like multiple waves, uh, but multiple waves might be better than a single wave. The total cases are down, as you see in this in this in this figure, uh, and therefore the surge requirements for hospitals are also down. But the economic disruption is prolonged, and we have another project with the OECD on coupling economic and epidemic dynamics. But the graph shows that you know, for one wave you have a very high number of infections, and for many waves you have a lower number of infections. So multiple waves is a kind of intermediate result, uh, and it represents a trade-off between surge demand and the duration of the disease, all right? And as, as Juwan said, it, it, you know, it could be that multiple waves are better than one wave. Um, all right, the bottom line for this talk and for our work is simply that behavior matters. To anticipate and control behavior, we need to understand why it's happening. What are the cognitive drivers? Uh, fear, distrust, psychic numbing are certainly among them, and they can be modeled and included in explanatory models and can give us leverage on behavior in epidemics, because if we know why people are changing their behavior, we might be able to design messages to avert or moderate that behavior. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, G1 and uh and Josh for a, a very interesting uh, way to look at um, epidemic modeling by bringing in uh, some of the emotional factors into decision-making. So uh, Paul, are you ready now to take the wheel? Uh, yes. Uh, again, people can at any time put questions into the chat. If you have questions for uh, G1 and Josh or uh, for, uh, uh, Sebastian, you can put those in the chat and we'll get to them during the Q&A. So please uh, go ahead, Paul. Okay, uh, good. Well, I'm really going uh, to just uh, uh, kind of uh, build on what uh, uh, Josh and Jiwan has have uh, been uh, speaking about. And uh, you'll see some of it uh, corresponds very closely to what they, they uh, uh, were presenting and others uh, show some other types of, uh, of uh, cognitive uh, 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 quirks that human beings have that uh, might be of, of a value in inserting into these kinds of models. So that's where I'm going. So uh, obviously uh, we've been saying that effective management of pandemic diseases needs to be informed by behavioral knowledge as well as knowledge uh, from medicine and public health, yet behavioral science has been greatly neglected and the modeling needs to be informed by the strange and sometimes irrational ways we respond to information about risk and the protective actions that experts say we need to take. And so this is, I'm just, you've seen this slide before. Uh, my, my talk is in the spirit of exactly what, uh, what uh, Josh was uh, uh, advocating here. And uh, also uh, how we might uh, um, build some uh, various uh, um, cognitive factors that we have discovered through research uh, into uh, uh, agents uh, uh, and agent-based uh, modeling. So I'll describe a few of these cognitive te tendencies that people exhibit that have been uh, uh, found in static behavioral studies of risk and decision-making, but these could be programmed into agents such as agent zero uh, to discuss, discover how populations of these agents behave in a dynamic env environment. Uh, during epidemics and other high-risk contexts, so that's what has been missing from my uh, side of the uh, of, of of this field. Uh, the static experiments is the the dynamics that you can uh, you can understand through the agent-based modeling. Uh, hopefully, this will provide insights that might help uh, better manage and control risk from pandemic disease and many other uh, uh, hazards. So what have we learned that might be useful here? Well, we, we, we have learned a lot about how humans think for better or for worse. Uh, we've learned about the, that, the complexity of the concept of risk and the difficult decisions it poses. And uh, something uh, that comes out of this, uh, I'll explain, is what we call the deadly arithmetic of compassion. So uh, maybe we can learn uh, something. Uh, we can use this uh, 
uh, knowledge in agent-based modeling and other simulations. Uh, let's start with thinking. So uh, an another Epstein, uh, I don't no know relation. <laughs> 1994 uh, did research and, and finding that in everyday life, people think in two fundamentally different ways. One labeled intuitive, automatic, natural, nonverbal, narrative, and experiential. The other analytical, deliberative, and verbal. Uh, in 2011, uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, built on this in a, a book that's become very famous, selling more than 15 million uh, copies, remarkable for an academic book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And he describes these modes of thinking. The experiential system is intuitive. It relies on images and associations that flit through our brains. And, it, and they create feelings, which we call affect, uh, that uh, drive behavior. It also is this affect is influenced by stories and narratives and images, and it's often non-conscious. Then we have the slower thinking, the analytic thinking that we're taught to do in school, deliberate, logical reasons uh, using, uh, it's quantitative, and we're very conscious of uh, what's going on. And it also constructs feelings, but that comes at the end of the analysis. We do the analysis and then we know, uh, have a sense of whether this is, uh, what we're talking about is good or bad, uh, an affective response. Uh, affect comes immediately in the fast system. So uh, as Kahneman points out, the human brain is lazy and we think we can, we can uh, uh, understand something and, and make a decision. Um, uh, with our fast thinking, we go that way because it's easy, it feels right, it usually works, uh, but the one problem is it's innumerate and thus can lead to serious mistakes. And those mistakes affect our behavior and, and uh, should be, uh, we should consider uh, uh, programming agents that uh, behave this way too to see how people might behave uh, in real uh, important situations. So what we find is that experiential, this fast experiential thinking, thinking with our gut feelings deceives us in the face of, of, of uh, a, a variety of important uh, uh, hazards in the world. Uh, it, it, it deceives us with regard to taking protective decisions when the probability of harm is small uh, and, and the consequences are large. It affects uh, whether we buy insurance or not, uh, whether we wear seat belts uh, voluntarily, cigarette smoking, uh, COVID, climate change, uh, 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 response to chemicals in the environment, uh, terrorism uh, risk, uh, uh, indifference towards genocide and disproportionate uh, horrendous uh, uh, killing uh, in warfare. These are some of the things that I and my colleagues have looked at from these, uh, perspective, this perspective. So why is it hard to make good intuitive decisions about these threats? Well, because the statistics and data often lack experiential meaning and emotion uh, that is needed to motivate us to act appropriately. So it, they fail to act, motivate us properly. This experience when, when the, uh, is misleading when important consequences are rare and their probability accumulates over time. I mean, we have experience over and over again of nothing happening. Uh, in a certain situation or if we behave a certain way. These safe experiences make us overconfident in our ability to control risk. We stop protecting against rare threats because we feel the costs more strongly than the benefits. Uh, uh, Josh talks uh, about this in the language of, of fear. Uh, uh, and I, that's what I call costs here. We value life inconsistently. Individual lives are very important but they lose their value when they become statistics. That's the psychic numbing. So let's look at this psychic numbing and uh, uh, which is one component of what we call the deadly arithmetic of compassion. And uh, this relates to the fact that, that, that emotions and feelings are an important uh, um, element of, of, of the meaning that information has for us. And that data and statistics lack emotion and meaning and may not motivate proper responses. So we find that our feelings, as miraculous as they are, as a guide, as the way they guide us through our daily uh, activities, uh, they're innumerate. They don't do arithmetic very well. So uh, protecting or say rescuing uh, one person at risk is huge and people risk their lives to save someone nearby who's in danger. Uh, 
uh, but saving if there are two people at risk, it doesn't feel uh, twice as, as concerning and we respond uh, uh, slightly less strongly than two. Sometimes though we respond even less strongly when there's two than when, when, there, when there's just one person. I'll talk about that. And since adding and multiplying are related, our feelings don't multiply either. And uh, this is uh, shown in a, in a quote by a Nobel Prize winning biochemist who became worried about nuclear war and said, I am deeply moved if I see one man suffering and would risk my life for him. Then I talk in personally about the possible pulverization of our big cities with 100 million dead. I am unable to multiply one man's suffering by 100 million. Well, uh, yes, that's a, we can't even multiply one man's suffering by a much smaller number. We don't multiply feelings. So, uh, so uh, we value these individual lives greatly. And in other contexts, our actions impute uh, little or no value to human life. Uh, Josh uh, uh, repeated this uh, quote that we uh, used to summarize our research, more who die, less we care. Uh, and in this sense, humans are often profoundly immoral uh, uh, because uh, of this, uh, this type of response. And uh, we can ask the question, what valuations of lives might we infuse into agents in various contexts before we send them off to interact? interact? We want to, uh, how much uh, morality do we want to give them? Uh, and that's uh, uh, related, we can sort of get a sense of this from a couple of questions about how should we value the saving of human lives uh, and how do we value the saving of human lives? And this could also be the lives of non-human creatures as well. So here are two normative models that we might want to build into agents or some proportion of agents, or some types of agents. One just simply is an additive as the number of lives at, 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 at risk increase, so the importance of saving them should increase linearly. It's just an additive model. Another uh, model recognizes that at some point we may cross the line uh, into the extinction of a community or species and the next lives lost are even more important to protect than the ones that came before them. So the, the, the function curves upward uh, as the number of lives at risk increase. So this, this, is, this is the kind of a, some aspect of morality we might want to build into our agents. Uh, but to how, uh, what does research show uh, as how we uh, actually do value the saving of human lives? Uh, Josh uh, uh, referred to this as the Weber-Fechner law because, and that's what's shown on the, on the left because we find uh, that, uh, that the valuation of life uh, has a similar function that the uh, going from zero to one is a big step. One person at risk, uh, you know, uh, motor, you know, uh, supercharges our emotional response. Two may we may not feel twice as good. And if I if I if I ask you to consider a situation where there were five people in danger, and and you'd feel concerned, and then and. But if I had asked you to consider a, a situ that situation where six people were in danger, you probably wouldn't feel any different. So you see that the curve flattens out here and becomes insensitive. Uh, but what we what we have also found, which uh, uh, remarkably uh, reflects the the uh, decay of, of fear in Josh's uh, models, as far, uh, is that actually uh, at some point the 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 value we attach to saving those lives and the feelings we have for them collapses. It decays uh, remarkably like the Rescorla Wagner uh, model that Josh presented. So maybe that model of fear is more general, not just for fear, but all kinds of you know, feelings of concern mm. uh, or other types of feelings here. Uh, so uh, we call this a fading or collapse uh, model. So one result of of uh, thinking this way is that statistics of risk don't move us to act when they lack experiential meaning, uh, they lack emotion uh, or feeling. So here's an example. Well, these are some quotes that says that we sort of know this uh, here, statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. So here's an example uh, my colleagues and I uh, looked at. Uh, the Syrian war started in 2011. Uh, the Bashar Assad started killing protesters. And it says, as this article says, as the death toll grows in Syria, so do desperate pleas for help. And this man is saying, you know, 
why is the world just ignore you know not helping us you know what's the uh, is this a, uh, is the world waiting for us to die of hunger and fear this was in february 2012 well what happened uh, after this plea for help uh, was was given you can see it in this graph of fatalities in in the syrian war the arrow points to the the point in time when that when when people were, there were about 15,000 uh, deaths people were crying for help no one listened and and you see that the death toll rose steadily uh, until uh, September of, of uh, 2015 when this graph uh, ends here and uh, something happened uh, 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 in that month that that changed things at least for a while and many of you probably saw this photograph of a boy whose family was fleeing from Syria uh, crossing the war uh, the waters and uh, towards Turkey, the boat capsized and the, and, the, and the boy drowned on the beach. This, this created an emotional reaction. Uh, and we sort of measured the effect of that reaction by looking at, uh, at Google searches under the, the terms uh, refugees. Uh, the, the war spawned millions of refugees and the word Syria. And you see, uh, and the little boy's name, you see, you see there, there was no, no interest uh, until that photograph came out and you see the spike there. But e even more important than Google searches is donations to aid agencies that were trying to help Syrian refugees. Uh, as in Sweden, this is data from Sweden, you see the same thing. Uh, the a uh, Red, Swedish Red Cross was getting about 400, uh, was getting about $8,000 a day uh, to help with uh, taking care of the refugees that, that, they, that came into Sweden. And it, it jumped 50 fold overnight when that photograph came out. And uh, so you see the importance of, a, uh, of an image that conveys feeling uh, over the statistics of hundreds of thousands of deaths. So um, uh, let's uh, switch now to uh, uh, COVID for a, a bit. Uh, why was the world slow to react to the onset of COVID? And what does this mean for the need to act to reduce the impacts of something like climate change? What does it take to motivate and be maintain behaviors that keep oneself and others safe when COVID is raging, uh, related to, again, what uh, Josh was presenting? So uh, we know that if, uh, uh, if uh, each infected person infects more than one other person, that is the condition for exponential uh, spread of COVID. Uh, and uh, COVID did spread exponentially. Uh, and uh, but this has been studied psychologically. How do people perceive exponential uh, growth? So here's a, an example of a, based on a, a study uh, that was done in 1975, uh, but I've, uh, I've brought it up to date with COVID. Uh, suppose that you have this, this data of increasing cases for five days. Uh, how many cases will it be on day 10? Well, I'm not going to have you take the time and to answer it, but just think quickly about it. Uh, I have an answer. It's about 21,500. When people do this, they vastly underestimate that the average response is about uh, uh, 2,000. This comes from a study in 1975 by psychologists on the misperception of exponential growth. Uh, so this is another factor that we need to take into account if we want to build agents who are responding like humans. Uh, they're, they're uh, perception when they get information about what's going on. So it's not only numbing, but the mis misperception. This is some data that shows the, the rise in cases and 100,000 cases, first 100,000 cases worldwide was three months. The second 100,000 took only 20, 12 days. What it shows is that when the, the, the exponentially increasing curve uh, uh, goes up, uh, it explodes. Uh, and can overwhelm uh, the systems. And fast thinking does not understand exponential growth. People project linearly instead of exponentially, and they, uh, they vastly underestimate uh, this. Climate change and its damages also happens exponentially, and we are underestimating uh, uh, where it's going and how quickly climate change will, uh, will explode and overwhelm us uh, if we don't take stronger action. And I I won't uh, go into some of the, uh, the data on, on the climate change exponential growth. Uh, but one of the things we find with climate change is that the science is good and, it, and scientists tell us things like how many inches or centimeters the sea level is going to rise. And, uh, but, but that has no experiential 
meaning. It doesn't convey emotion in us. Uh, uh, what we need are images of you know what will happen to uh, to familiar or, or valued uh, uh, properties on the coast uh, under uh, different uh, levels of sea level uh, rise, as the Boston Globe did when they projected how uh, Mar-a-Lago is going to look under certain uh, levels of sea level rise. That's that conveys meaning and and emotion and motivates action. So the message from COVID for climate change is act now before it's too late, before we get overwhelmed with it. So another problem with COVID is the failure to initiate and maintain needed protective behaviors. And basically what we find, this is related again to what Josh was saying, is that, that uh, we don't feel rewarded from doing the right thing because the, the, we don't see who we're, protect, we're who's protecting from us. Uh, uh, we have a kind of a backwards cost, uh, cost reward experience. Uh, um, we, we don't experience any benefit from doing the right thing, like isolating, but we feel an immediate cost. We don't experience a cost for not doing the wrong thing, and we experience an immediate benefit. With this backwards cost-benefit experience, uh, we're not going to maintain behavior over time. We may do it for a while, and then we'll stop. It doesn't seem worth it, uh, given our sense of, of risk and benefit. So there needs to be external uh, costs and rewards to shape and maintain proper protective behaviors, uh, which may all, this may then not be met uh, with, uh, uh, greeted by the public. But again, if you want to con control that behavior, you, we can see now that the reinforcement uh, principles for a rare disease are backwards and won't help uh, maintain it. So uh, this is just uh, reinforcing it. But the same thing that happens with COVID also happens with uh, wearing seat belts or smoking one cigarette at a time or uh, uh, re uh, doing the right thing for climate change, we, we may not feel the immediate reward, we feel an immediate cost. We, we might wanna build those into models. Another uh, com behavioral complexity is risk is politics, uh, which we could talk about in the discussion and models could distribute varying ideological and political views among populations of agents mm -hmm. to reveal their impacts and losses and assess the effects of inter, in, uh, intervention. This is just a, an example of, uh, of the COVID mortality uh, related to part, partisan political views. And one last point before I close, things like communication. We obviously, we can build communication uh, into, the, uh, into the models uh, and framing is important and it relates to this emotion. Uh, a 20% probability uh, means the same as 20 out of 100, but people react differently to this, if you uh, if uh, if you uh, if you tell them uh, twenty percent, people just think this is a number. If you say twenty out of a hundred patients like this person might be violent on release of a, from a mental uh, a facility, mental health facility, double the uh, the the supervisors refuse to re refuse uh, release the patient because the, the frequentistic mode generates uh, images, violent imagery. Uh, that leads to higher perception of risk, stronger feelings, and a lower discharge rate. It doesn't occur with a percent framing. Again, all of this can be played with in, in modeling. So uh, uh, with that, I'd like to let Josh have the final words on cognitive epidemiology, uh, which I uh, hope that I have shown the, the value of, of his wisdom that despite it being very crude, let's get the synthesis started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for a, a, a very uh, stimulating talk. The, uh, uh, so uh, we uh, can uh, go to our uh, discussion period now. The, uh, um, I will, uh, let's see, Juliet, uh, would you like to lead the, the kick off the discussion? Sure, Don, I'm happy to. Um, thanks everyone. Those were really interesting talks and, and I think highlighted um, very related but also very different ways of looking at this problem. Um, and I'm gonna start with um, some of the questions that are um, in the chat. I think some of them have been answered already. Um, please do continue to add questions to the chat. Um, and um, Specifically for questions that are directed towards one speaker, um, the speaker should feel free to uh, to go ahead and and um, 
add responses to the chat as Seb has already started doing. Um, but um, I think we're, we'll try to focus the discussion on some of the bigger picture issues that, that cross across, uh, cross between the, the themes. Um, so um, I'm gonna start um, with, um, with a question um, that I think is directed towards Paul, but is um, maybe also something that um, that that Josh and um, Jiwon could could comment on, um, which is a question of whether um, it it matters whether you know the people at risk and um, whether the models depend on the individuals being strangers, um, and whether that can be incorporated. Take that taking that a step further. Um, into some of the spatial structure, uh, for example, that was shown in the models that Juwan presented? Uh, yes, I, I, it absolutely uh, matters uh, because uh, um, if, if, you, if you know them, you have a stronger emotional re uh, response, a stronger motivation to act in a, in a, in a way that uh, uh, might, uh, might help those, those people. So, uh, and, and Clearly, that could be built into 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 the models uh, uh, as well. So it's it's very important. It also uh, matters whether they are, are are kind of nearby, near to you, uh, you know, geographically or distant uh, uh, in that way, or or whether the impacts are uh, are close are close to you in time or distant in time. Another form of 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 uh, closeness. Yeah, I would say we. I think that's a good question. We have incorporated networks into our mm -hmm. into our, you know, into our model, and uh, fear transmits on social networks. So yes, it matters if you know people. Uh, the disease, of course, is purely spatial, but the fear is networked. Um, and I wonder, Seb, whether um, in terms of measuring, um, measuring, I guess you know, clustering in terms of these processes. Do you have any thoughts on on whether there are specific things that could be measured or how that might be done? Not really, no. And I think, um, I mean, it's sort of also, you know, there were a few questions already on um, of what we should measure and what, what the relevant level of detail is that we should measure. And it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell without measuring everything and then um, coming up to coming to some kind of decision or conclusion on that. And um, yeah, so I think um, maybe the key points, and again, just reflecting on some of the um, discussions in terms of how we can measure things or what we should measure, is just to come up with with approaches to measuring data, quantifying behavior and measuring behavior that can be done in a sort of consistent manner and allow these kind of comparisons so we understand a bit better what, what really um, drives uh, epidemic dynamics. I don't think I have a better answer to that. If Sorry. I can chime in a tiny bit, we just finished a different NSF, uh, NSF rapid grant where we tried to actually calibrate the coupled contagion model, the New York State uh, COVID data, where we had, you know, case data, which is not hard to find. Uh, David Bronyatovsky and Mark Dredzies, who are who are big figures in Twitter mining, uh, you know, it's very crude again, and a million issues and problems, but it was a crude way of getting at sentiments, concerns, fear, and, and that component of it. And then we had uh, geolocated cell phone data on mobility. And, you know, we did, we did, you know, an interesting analysis that kind of get our teeth into the problem. I think one issue with the data is, you know, that there's a lot of data, but it's not motivated by any theoretical, it's not theoretically motivated. So yes, there's a whole pile of data on mobility, but you don't care about mobility. You care about concentration and density. It's not just people moving. So, you know, I think, I think, as happens in, in lots of sciences, I think the data, there may needs to be a new round of data collection that's actually motivated by these models. I think we sort of go out and say, well, there's vast data, I, you know, but big data is no good if it's 
irrelevant to the to the theory. Yeah, in some in some ways, the data is data of convenience. We have mobile right. phones now. We can track mobile phones now. We can track uh, the contact patterns, uh, but um, having the any data on the other side of that, the emotional component, the uh, uh, the you know, what goes into the decision making processes, we don't we have very very little data on. Yeah, but I think Paul's work gets our teeth into that. I mean, yeah, that's we do the, have that's, good that's, experimental that's, data on some of these right? general. Uh, you know, relationships. So, you know, funny way, the micro part of it is we at least have a handle on some of that in some, in some yeah, rough but way. But at the same time, what I've learned from, from, uh, from you, Josh, is the, the power of the, uh, of the modeling to, to, to vary these parameters. Right. When, I, when I do an, uh, an experiment, I've been lately doing experiments, uh, which I call survey experiments on populations, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of people, and I, and, I, and I give them, you know, different inf kind, kinds of information and see how they react. But that's very slow and cumbersome, and, it depends, yeah. and you have to make a lot of assumptions as, you know, how are you going to ask the questions and things, and, and you only have and one point in time. And, and so it's, you know, it, right. it, it, it's not very efficient. Uh, whereas, yeah. you know, we can get some general principles like I've tried to present, and then you can manipulate those, you know, with yeah, let's put them in, put them into agents and see what yeah. we, what, what comes out. Yeah, Absolutely, I really like that. Yeah, I, I, I love it. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I'd like to redirect a little bit um, to another question um, that um, comes here that relates to to a quote that I wrote down. Um, I think it was from you, Josh, um, that you can get multiple multiple waves from the agent zero framework, which I think um, I think what you presented was was really interesting, and um, there's um, there's a lot of value there. Um, but there's a question in the chat um, about um, how that relates to what we've seen in the COVID pandemic. So so certainly. Um, that is not sufficient to explain what we've seen in the in the COVID pandemic. We've seen the serial emergence of of, of variants that have changes in the underlying uh, pathogen. No, of course, of course. For, for example, yeah. um, and and so the question is really, um, what do we need to measure to understand the purely epidemiological feature uh, features of those changes versus the confounding of those with behavioral factors and and those feedback processes that that you're focused on sure. how do we in order in order to come up with a predictive framework um for example how do we think about the fact that we can generate these waves in multiple different waves and and sorry we can generate the waves in multiple different ways and um how do we put that information together um to be able to move into a predictive realm Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Obviously, a huge challenge. I, it may have gone by quickly, but what I was talking about the, the the applicability of the model to COVID, I was saying pre the pre variants. If you fix the variant, then you can get endogenous waves by the mechanisms mm -hmm. I described. But right, it's a whole other curveball when there's a new variant entirely, and how people react to that. I mean, I think again in in the sort of risk communication uh, area, you know. Fear uh, depends on surprise. If you're not surprised, you don't really get afraid. You don't get one of these fear spikes. And what is surprise? It's the violation of expectations. So if you tell people that, you know, if, if you, you need to tell people that there might be another variant, so they don't, they don't go into a, you know, into a tailspin when it, when it happens. And the general area of risk communication, I think, is this whole business about ablating the fear spikes, you know, is an important thing. I, I'm not, I know I'm straying a little bit from your question, but for example, you know, we told people, I mean, the public health authorities told people, okay, we're, uh, we're past the, you know, we're past the peak. And that invites people to be relieved. And in fact, if you look at these all epidemics, Roughly half the transmissions occur after the peak. I mean, all these curves are unimodal curves, if not perfectly symmetrical. So when you say we're past the peak, we've turned the corner, you're inviting a very a tremendous resistance and impatience and, and, and the rest of it, uh, because you've you've invited people to think they're out of the woods when they're in the very thick of the woods when it's at its peak. So these are the kinds of things that I think uh, you know we should we should we should be careful how we communicate the situation to avert the kind of uh, 
uh, contagious emotions that that we see. That's that's not exactly on your point. Your your point is a very deep point, and of course, I don't exactly know how we do that. But with regard to the multiple peaks, what what I uh, tried to show much too quickly was was going a little deeper into what uh, Josh was modeling with regard to fear and its decay and and how that which was the fact that that the reward cost experience uh, of an individual uh, is 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 backwards from what is needed to maintain uh, vigilance. So because that when we 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 do uh, the things like masking and isolating, we don't feel the benefit; we feel the cost. And so uh, and that's fundamental. It's just like the Viscorla Wagner is fundamental to uh, you know behavioral. This this is basic reinforcement. A theory that goes back to the early early psychology, and what it tells us is that that there has to be external uh, rewards and punishments in, infused into this uh, uh, situation to, to if you want people to maintain the behavior. And I think that's an important thing, and and that also I think could be modeled. Yeah. Um, so uh, another thing. Yeah. Oh, go oh, on. Go ahead. <laughs> I can. No, no, I, go ahead. I, Okay, so on that specific point on like diff new variants and differentiating between potential behavioral confounding factors and new variants, I mean, I think we have we we have techniques for that kind of thing, right? We have statistical techniques for um, understanding the influence of certain bits of data or certain parameters on a model, and and we can do statistical validation. I mean, I think ultimately it's a very generic problem in that um, we're trying to in in making predictions or scenarios we're trying to um extrapolate from the past into the future the more of a mechanistic understanding we can develop the more confident can we be um in our predictions but i think there's nothing really in terms of i mean apart from you know trying to have continuous measurements of behavior as well as uh, some understanding some some data-based understanding of new variants and then putting both of these in a the model i don't think there's anything fundamental that we can do to get to a better understanding of that. Yeah, you could you could argue that the data sources for the genetic sequencing or the movement patterns or weather and climate, the data sources are more precise, more granular uh, compared to what we have on the behavior and what we're calling fear or emotion or the like. Uh, and orders of magnitude different in terms of the kind of data that we have to do the kind of model fitting you're talking about, Sebastian. Okay, so we have um, a question from Madhav um, that is addressed to all of the, a broad question for everyone, um, which I think um, I'll uh, ask next. So um, we saw examples of different types of models um, in, in the second talk um, and um, the question that Madhav is asking is um, what level of model fidelity you need to have um, and represent, represent and caption certain, capture certain behaviors. Um, so when can individual levels beha behaviors be, um, I guess, summarized or, or captured um, within an ODE style model? And when do you actually need to move to the agent-based version? Um, and how do we balance between the, those complexities? Um, and then I would add to that, where do the data come in? What's the difference in the data that's needed? Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good question. And the ODE picture, the differential equations picture, and the agent picture are, of course, radically different. And I think of those early uh, not so early. I mean, the, the Royal Society was was last summer. Uh, that they're more phenomenological. They say, you know, here in the mean field uh, setting are what you'd expect to be these adaptations based on a contagious fear, something like this. The agent model really tries to get under the hood and give some sort of cognitive account of what's driving those behaviors. So I think, uh, you know test the coupled contagion mean field model, you know, that's that's in some ways, it's certainly different. I don't know if it's easier or harder than to really try to get your teeth into these cognitive dynamics that, that Paul was talking about. So, you know, I think it's a good question. I'm not entirely sure how to answer it. 
Uh, but it, my, my gut feeling is that the, the sort of differential equation picture is, is easier to compare to data just for the simple reason that it has fewer levels, really. And again, I've, we, uh, several people have tried to do this, and I, I tried to do it with this NSF rapid grant, uh, you know, with some success, trying to say, look, can we, can we get the couple contagion picture uh, by looking at this Twitter data on fear, New York State data on cases, and geolocated uh, cell phone data for mobility. But again, I think it's hard because mobility doesn't really capture density. Um, and we need, we need more concerted data collection efforts that are motivated by these models in the first place. I think that's really a key. I don't think just because there's a lot of data lying around doesn't mean any of it is particularly suited to testing either of these approaches. So to my mind, I think that an effort should be made in really designing data collection with this in mind. You know, I mean, I'm not, new theories uh, tell people what data to collect. I mean, if you look, for example, at Maxwell and electromagnetic theory, the theory predicted that there should be these things, radio waves, and then Hertz goes out and, and finds them, but he didn't know what to look for without the theory. And the same for, you know, light bending in a gravitational field. I mean, you know, nobody knew to look for that. And Eddington went out and, and, and you know, measured it. So I think in some cases we need to be you know, tough and on the data world and say, look, you know, these theories are producing different pictures and we need to collect data with that emphasis in mind, rather than just start with whatever data is lying around and see if we can fit these models. I, I don't think that's been very successful and I'm skeptical that it will be. I, if I can suggest that there, you know, there, the the field of health behavior change, there is a fair amount of theory already, and it's taught as health uh, behavior change in um, schools of public health and medicine and are reused. They, they have names, they, the, the, uh, the, the health belief model or the trans theoretical model or the stages of change model. And, and, there are a lot, you know, and, the, and these all have in common are the balancing of perceived risk and perceived benefit. But nobody quantitates those things. Nobody you know, goes out and actually measures what they mean when they talk about these things, even though we teach them. Uh, so I, 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 one of the things I'd suggest for the group is to, you know, if we want to make a build a bridge to the public health community, you know, recognizing that there are these existing health behavior change models that are conceptually useful but completely non-quantitative at the moment. And so Paul, when you were saying about the synthesis, that's sort of the synthesis I was thinking about was putting quantitation to uh, some of these behavior change models. Uh, I, yes, and, and, and some, some of us have been uh, doing that. So for example, when you have a model <laughs> that has perceived risk in it, in it well, what, what does that, what is perceived risk? We now know that perceived risk is driven primarily by by feelings it's a feeling we have we, most of us aren't going around calculating probabilities and 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 cost multiplying and probabilities yeah. yeah costs and benefits and doing doing uh, calculations we're using our gut feelings and so when we study the way our gut feelings react to information information about scale information about whether you 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 know the victim or not or things like that and and quantifying that we are we are uh, providing quantitative information about how uh, how factors how context affects our feelings of risk and this could be uh, uh, useful for modeling if I can just the footnote is you know those, those I think you know I think it's fair to say that those models are when you say the health belief model it's really a kind of uh, you know it's a variant on the rational actor picture. The agent takes account of his situation, they make a computation of costs and benefits, and they do the right thing. And the whole idea of Agent Zero is to provide a formal, a formal model that's an alternative to the rational actor where feelings and non-deliberative components and all sorts of other stuff are in play as we know they are. So I've always found the health belief model to be a pretty impoverished picture of human Josh, behavior. I, Josh, I completely disagree. Uh, okay. The, uh, 
And, there, and these are perceived risks and perceived benefits, and they're explicitly called that. And I know, but you have to plug they plug those into the model. Those are outputs of the model, not inputs. But they come from somewhere. Look, I'm saying that model requires those as inputs. Our model produces them as outputs. I think we need the data to come from somewhere to for, to actually inform the model so that it we really can build a model based on data. Uh, and if there is perceived risk or perceived benefit, the question is, how do we measure those things? Right. I, I, I don't disagree with that. I'm saying that the idea is why, what's generating your perceptions of risk and what is generating your perceptions of, uh, you know, of the scale of things and, and so forth. I mean, I just think it's a pretty wooden, you tell the model what the level of risk is and it'll tell you what the guy does. And I'm saying, I don't, you know, you can do that and it might be useful in some forecasting setting. But if we want a deep explanatory model of why humans are doing what they do, I don't think that really gets its teeth in one. I think you want to be under the hood and get at this sort of cognitive level. I agree if you're trying to figure out, you know, what to do in a narrow kind of forecasting setting, that might be perfectly adequate, but I don't think it's deep science. I don't think it illuminates I, the human condition, which is what we're interested in. I see that Simon has his hand raised. Yeah. Sorry, I was, <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to just uh, briefly go back to, to Madov's question, uh, which is a good question, but I think oversimplifies in, in the sense that it's not either um, mean, mean field ODEs versus um, agent-based models. There are lots of ways to build structure into models without going to an agent-based model. Um, model, you've done a lot, of, for example, on networks, there's uh, um, age structure, uh, geographic structure, social structure, all sorts of things. And in fact, that uh, <laughs> um, when we started the MIDAS project back and, and the agent-based models were developed, there was uh, a recognition that once one had the agent-based models, it would then be useful to try to collapse the dimensionality mm -hmm. um, in, into um, um, in, in, into analytical descriptions that could be looked at that had a lot of structure in them. Just a comment. Mm -hmm. Juliet, if I could just comment uh, for 20 seconds on what uh, the nice debate with Don and Josh. I think Don was raising two important points. One is taking an informal theory and making it, I would say, computationally realizable or mathematically realizable. I think that's one point jo I think Don was making, and I think it's an important one, having studied those theories, this translation from a verbal description to a computationally formal description. There are many ways to do that, and I think these models can help. I think Josh's question of generation is actually an interesting one, but Josh, if you take it to extreme, there's a recursion there, right? Because a big part there's a certain amount of recursive aspect to it because you decide on certain behaviors that lead to that behavior. But you know, there might be even deeper sense of representation that might lead to your set of- Of uh, course, of and, course. And, and that's a harder question for me, of course, but I'm just pointing out that that recursion hasn't gone away from a general science in, in, in cognitive science and, and in computer yeah, science. Fair enough, fair enough. But I mean, that's exactly right. And you can always say, you know, right. And what caused that and what caused that? And it's turtles all the way down. But but I'm going a few turtles down and trying to do better than, uh, you know, than just kind of, you know, fluid dynamics, you know. So there is a okay. question here about have we has anyone created models of minority behaviors uh, that um, that reflect uh, possible differences in the behaviors, uh, and uh, so I'll throw that out as a as a question uh, for the for the modelers. Well, I, if I if I may, um, you know this this it went by very very fast, and I you know but but this issue of trust in the government announcement of the situation would certainly vary between social groups and possibly between uh, spatial, you know, groups. I mean, it might be that, you know, kind of speaking crudely, blue states and red states might interpret the government signal quite differently, or different ethnic groups or racial groups might interpret them quite differently. And I think that might well be measurable, or at least estimable, 
so that the model could give that kind of socioeconomic spatial differentiation, which I do think is obviously present and might be might be captured. So good question. Another another difference is in the population is that so in the model we have a parameter called the probability to self-isolate. Some people have to, even though they have a high level of fear, they have to go out and work. Then they, even though their disposition to self-isolate is high, they have to go out and um, get vulnerable to disease. So that is also another um, difference Absolutely. that we can have in the population. Right. So I think there's an interesting question here from Mike Lee, um, who um, is asking about what are the effects of um, the psychic numbing of having gone through this pandemic on new um, epidemics and outbreaks that may be emerging in the future? Um, and how do we how do we think about that in terms of p potential changes in the baseline um, of where people's reactions to things start out? Any thoughts on that? I mean, that, that, that is exactly the, the point that is really difficult, right? It's generalizing because we don't have good good theory that kind of explains what we've observed so far. So or, so we, I think, um, I mean, there's, so there's, two, there's also the following question, I think, which is an excellent one about um, Peru and kind of how campaigns should be phrased. And I think, I mean, that's slightly out but beyond, I think, maybe what we discuss here and certainly my domain of expertise. I think there's a, perhaps some things we can learn from just how communication was conducted in the pandemic, but in terms of um, understanding future behavior and behavioral numbing, I'm, I'm just not sure we have a good understanding of that. I don't think we have a good answer to these really excellent questions. And I think we, we need to think about maybe just coming back to the point of data collection is how, what what would allow us better to, to, uh, to understand this and to use this to quantify models of um, future outbreaks? Yeah, well, so I this is the I, question. I, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, uh, I think the, the question that, uh, that the individuals ask themselves when they hear about uh, new, uh, new variants uh, is, uh, will this affect me? You know, because in the past, I, you know, I, I really wasn't very affected by, by what was going on. And so you, you look for, for, for cues in the context, you know, people that you know have been, who have become infected, how serious was it and so forth. So it, it's, it's very much based on our experience uh, with it either directly or through the media as, as to whether we'll, uh, we'll take it seriously or we'll just say, well, this is more of the same and, and I, you know, I don't have to worry about it any more than, than the previous one, which I no longer worry about. So Don, um, we're um, at a quarter of, um, do you have any sort of summary statements that you'd like to make? Uh, no, but uh, thanks. The uh, uh, We've had uh, presentations from three outstanding uh, groups. Uh, we have uh, world-class experts in, uh, in uh, Seb and uh, Josh and uh, Jaywan and Paul. Uh, the whole idea here was to frame this question, are there more and better theories that we can bring to modeling of behavior? And what can what is it going to take to do that? Uh, and again, I thought this, this discussion was very rich uh, about what are the components of that. Still a lot of work to do about saying, what, are, what do we really want to measure? How do we go about measuring that? And then how do we instantiate that in computational models? Uh, but uh, I think this is a good starting point, uh, uh, and uh, there's a divergence. You know, there's some divergence of opinion, which is great. Uh, but I think that we all agree that this is a really important topic, and that probably we're not going to solve forecasting of infectious disease epidemics until we get better at understanding the behavioral components of that. Uh, and uh, so, um, as I as I showed a slide, I was glad to see that the NSF has been taking it seriously. My, my read on those that they were not particularly rich in theory, 
they were pretty much rich in data and computation, which is fine. We need that too. Uh, but uh, I'd love to see this discussion continue in, in other forms. So uh, I want to thank uh, the, uh, the organizers. Uh, um, uh, and I'll pass it off to you in a second, Mara, but I wanted to particularly add, uh, thank uh, uh, the um, uh, Seb and Paul and Josh and Jay Wan and uh, Juliet for what I thought was an absolutely terrific uh, set. So thank you very much. Back thank to you, you. Thank you. Yeah, I just will take 30 seconds, Juliet. And, and, but I want to thank you both, Juliet and Don, for moderating the session and the speakers. And I think you can re realize how interesting this topic is. We are 15 minutes over the time. Huh. You still have 100 folks on, online. That actually speaks a lot for such a vibrant discussion you folks had. We meet again at 2 o'clock. We are going to collect all this information and make sure that NSF gets a chance to take a look. That's the reason they want us to organize these meetings. They want to hear from the community. And so I really appreciate the questions and this session. Thank you very, very much. And we'll see you all at 2 o'clock. Thanks, Take care. everyone. Thank, Thank you. Care. Bye. Bye Thank you very much. Thanks, Julian. Don. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.